Right. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining and, and welcome. Before we begin today's webinar, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items um, in, in the event that you are not familiar with Zoom or have not participated in one of these webinar series. My name is Jennifer Schaefer, and I will be your Zoom host for the afternoon. So please feel free to shoot me a chat if you have any issues um, from a technical perspective. Um, so feel free to contact me. We do ask that you change your Zoom name to be your first and last name. You can do this by going to the participant panel and finding your name, which should be at the top of the list, and just hitting rename. Engagement, please contribute your questions and comments via the chat window. We will be collecting those and a moderator will ask them on your behalf during the end of the webinar uh, for Q&A portion. If you need closed captioning, we will be putting a link in the chat here momentarily. Again, technical issues, please feel free to contact me. This webinar is being recorded, so by going off mute and by turning on your camera, you agree and consent to having your image and audio captured. And with that, I will turn it over to Lynn Wilkins to introduce our moderators for today. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. Um, I wanted to introduce you to the uh, NCI Cohort Consortium webinar series. Um, its purpose is to, um, well, its purpose was to address um, comments that were made in the last annual meeting, which were that people would like more contact with the Cohort Consortium than once a year annual meetings. More people would like to be involved. And um, there were topics that um, people would like to have seen covered. So we thought a webinar series would be a great way to achieve these things. And, and I'm happy to say that we're having our sixth webinar today. And um, we have a great, um, great speaker and moderators, and I would like to introduce them. We have Dr. Betty Kahn, who's a research scientist at um, Kaiser Permanente in Northern California. And we have Dr. Sam uh, Antwi, and he's an associate professor um, at Mayo Clinic, and I will turn it over to them. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, Lynn. Um, so I get the pleasure of introducing Dr. Feliciano. Um, Elizabeth Feliciano is an epidemiologist and a research scientist too at the Kaiser Permanente Northern California Division of Research. Her research uses electronic health records, our stored biospecimens, and our patient population to conduct studies of cancer survivorship and cancer care. She completed her doctorate in epidemiology and nutrition at the Harvard T. Chan, T. H. Chan School of Public Health before joining us at Kaiser Permanente in 2015. One of her main focuses since she came to Kaiser as a postdoc has been to understand the role of sarcopenia in non-metastatic cancer on a variety of cancer outcomes. This has led her to really study the intersection of cancer and aging as she tries to disentangle the muscle loss that's due to aging versus due to cancer. She received a K award to routinely integrate measures of muscle wasting into cancer clinical care. And then shortly thereafter, she received a series of R01s, three of them in, in the first year after she got her K award from NCI and NIA to study the impact of patient body composition on the breast tumor microenvironment, to test novel methods to measure muscle mass in colon cancer patients, and to use CT images to assess patient frailty in surgical care. She is a prolific writer and terrific speaker, and I am pleased to introduce Dr. Feliciano to you today. Thank you for presenting to this group. Thank you, Betty. Um, I'm gonna share my screen if that's okay. Let's see. Um, Uh, Jennifer, does this look good to you? It looks great. Okay, excellent. Um, so thank you so much for that introduction, Betty, and to all of you for participating in this webinar series. I'm, I'm excited to talk about measurements of aging in cancer cohorts. Um, let's see, can I advance my slides? There we go. 
Um, I'm going to talk about three topics. The first is why even study this intersection of cancer and aging? Why is it important? The second uh, and biggest part of my talk is what are aging metrics, you know, with the angle of what's relevant to cancer cohorts? And then lastly, I'm going to share with you an example of how we've tried to operationalize some of these in the Women's Health Initiative, which is one of the cohorts in the NCI cohort consortium. So first of all, older survivors are a growing population. So there's a lot of people experiencing this collision of cancer and aging. By 2040, more than 26 million prevalent cancers in the United States will, will be with us. And three quarters of those cases will be among individuals older than 65 years. So this is really a, a lo already large and growing segment of the survivorship population who are older adults. And second, there's an interplay biologically of aging and cancer. Cancer uh, is caused by aging. Chronologic aging is a major risk factor for cancer, uh, likely because of some of the biologic changes shown in the cartoon in the center that occur with aging. These are things like chronic inflammation, things like genomic instability, changes in nutrient sensing. But also when you're diagnosed with cancer at an older age, that limits your treatment options, partly because your oncologist is worried that you're gonna experience, if you're a frail older adult, severe toxicity. Um, and those same toxicities are thought to you know, be due to damage to normal cells that induces biological aging through many of the same mechanisms shown in the cartoon in the center. So aging is a risk factor for cancer, but cancer and its treatments can also cause aging. This is a topic of great interest to many of us in the field and spurred a series of workshops over the years hosted by NCI that are summarized really nicely in the JNCI article uh, cited in the bottom right and have kind of culminated in a notice of special interest that came out on the effects of cancer and cancer treatment on aging trajectories and outcomes. And one of the things put forward in these white papers that came out of this workshop is a conceptual model or sort of theoretical model of aging trajectories that I really like and is what's shown on the slide here. I put physical function on the y-axis, but you could really have any aging outcome. And the idea is that there's some trajectory of these aging outcomes that occurs uh, in people who never experience a cancer diagnosis shown by the green line. It's shown as linear, it's probably exponential. And you, you decline with age, with chronologic age until you experience some kind of functional impairment. But if you have cancer, if you experience cancer diagnosis and treatment, then perhaps that alters your trajectory. Maybe you have a decline in physical function that occurs prior to your diagnosis, some acute drop during that period of active treatment, and then some rebound after which you might age at a similar pace to your non-cancer peer, um, but never recover to the same level. And that's the phase shift hypothesis. Or your trajectory might look a little different. Maybe you have accelerated aging where you experience this drop, but then after your rebound, you're aging at a pace, your physical function is declining at a pace that is faster than that of your non-cancer peers. So these are hypotheses because there really hasn't been research in this area to characterize these aging trajectories. And that's one of the research needs that this NOCI highlights is to define and characterize these aging trajectories. And I bring that up because, you know, this is really something the cancer cohorts can contribute to. Another gap is long-term and late effects of cancer treatment. Uh, how severe are they? When do they emerge? We need to follow people over time as cohorts have to demonstrate this. Uh, what are the statistical strategies? Uh, what models are relevant to understand the effect of cancer and its treatment on aging outcomes? And what are the mechanisms? What biologically is underpinning the emergence of an accelerated aging phenotype? Uh, and then lastly, what are interventions that can prevent or mitigate this accelerated aging? So I, I encourage you to look at these papers and at this NOCI because they really nicely summarize some of the gaps, many of which cancer cohorts could contribute meaningfully to addressing. Um, so why study cancer and aging? Well, there's a high burden and a lot of unanswered questions. And I think specifically I'll share with you in my example, I think cancer cohorts can contribute to understanding long-term trajectories of aging outcomes to characterizing the relationship between biologic and functional uh, measures of aging in survivors, and then also to just some descriptive epidemiology on what is the real incidence and severity of aging phenotypes in different groups of survivors as compared to usual aging. 
So what is this thing called aging that is so important? I'm going to talk now about metrics of aging. Um, we think of aging usually in the chronologic sense, and development does proceed somewhat predictably during the first five decades of life. But after that point, things diverge um, based on different behaviors, different genetic susceptibility, different environmental stressors. And, and that difference is kind of what we think of as biologic aging. Um, and this is the first bucket of aging metrics I want to talk about. And I'm using a framework here that's laid out by Luigi Ferrucci that I, of NIA that I think is really useful because there's sort of three buckets of aging metrics which are temporally and causally related. So the first is biological aging. This is the root mechanisms, molecular damage, uh, things like defective repair me mechanisms. And these are uh, characterized specifically by variables such as those shown in the gray box on the right. Then there's phenotypic aging. So these are phenotypes that actually are dynamic and change over time, things like body composition, homeostatic mechanisms like insulin resistance or immunosenescence that have measurable changes over time. And then there's functional aging where your accumulated biologic and phenotypic aging sort of culminates in a in a deficit, in an impact on your daily life and your cognitive function or your physical function. And so there, the temporal and causal order is such that the biological aging is thought to underpin the changes in the phenotype, which are then thought to occur prior to and underpin the changes in the functional aging. And so this is appealing because when you study biological and phenotypic aging, then you can shed light on potential mechanisms upon which we could intervene. But also there's a potential here for early detection. Maybe there's changes in the biology detectable prior to overt changes in the phenotype, or maybe the phenotype can be screened for before the patient experiences an overt functional deficit, opening the possibility of uh, early intervention. So the first metric uh, of aging I want to talk about is a biological aging metrics. And I'm going to focus here on three biomarkers that I think are particularly ready for prime time in cohort studies. They have different pros and cons in my view, um, and they get at different aspects of biological aging. So the first one I'm going to talk about is epigenetic age. So this is a composite measure of DNA methylation across select CPG loci. And so these are patterns of DNA, DNA methylation, clocks, if you will, that are trained on some aging outcome, often chronologic age, but sometimes a suite of clinical biomarkers indicative of phenotypic aging, things like immunosenescence or plasma proteins related to health and disease. Regardless of how these clocks are trained, they are often quite predictive of morbidity and mortality across cohorts. And that includes being predictive of cancer risk and mortality, as well as frailty and functional impairment. Um, and so the general idea for a clock train, say, on chronologic age is that you might have chronologic age versus methylation age. And th these are, in fact, often represented as the residuals from a regression of DNA methylation age on chronologic age, partly because you want to measure this acceleration, this difference between the chronologic and biological aging. So that's a bit of what's shown on the left-hand side in the dot plot, where you have methylation age on the y-axis and chronologic age on the x-axis. And the individual with the gradient dot, that person has a biologic and a chronologic age that are equivalent. They're on the line of unity. But those individuals in the red dots, they have a methylation age that's older than their chronologic age might suggest. And those individuals are going to progress to aging-related syndromes like frailty at younger chronologic ages, and probably not going to live as long as the people in the blue dots whose methylation age is younger than their chronologic age uh, might suggest. And, and this comes uh, really out of the framework put forward by my colleague, Alexandra Binder, who's an epigenetic aging expert. So this is relevant to cancer and cancer survival. Some of the best data demonstrating that cancer and its treatments induce aging comes from adult survivors of childhood cancer where uh, accelerated aging has been well characterized. And this is one of those studies where they saw that epigenetic age, in this case, it's a phenotypic clock, I believe it's Morgan Levine's pheno age, is on average 10 years higher in adult survivors of childhood cancer than it is in age match controls. And that older epigenetic age is associated with 
receiving specific types of cancer treatment with unfavorable lifestyle behaviors and also with prevalent chronic conditions. So this is suggesting now that epigenetic age can distinguish an accelerated aging phenotype potentially. In addition, these clocks are sensitive to different stimuli. Um, and one of those is chemoradiotherapy. So this is a study conducted in breast cancer patients where they saw that grim age, which is a DNA methylation-based surrogate for health plasma proteins, including things like GDF15 and smoking pack years. Um, and that clock is actually strongly associated with morbidity and mortality, as well as other biological markers of aging, like mitochondrial dysfunction and senescence. That clock shoots up from pre to post diagnosis in this population of breast cancer survivors. And I put this up here because I think not only does it demonstrate that these clocks change in response to chemotherapy, but I only put up one of the clocks measured in that study. They actually looked at a variety of epigenetic clocks and saw changes in many of them, suggesting that when you measure epigenetic age, when you measure the epigenome, you can calculate several clocks, and those clocks are reflective of different aspects or facets of aging. And they can generate hypotheses about what are the pathways that are impacted by specific types of cancer treatment. So for example, they also saw changes in the proportion of senescent, senescent immune cells, um, according to uh, an immunosenescence clock that they looked at. Um, so one of the reasons that this, these clocks are beneficial for cohorts is that you can look at these different pathways, but also because they're relatively stable in stored samples. I mean, they're really a practical measure in some sense because DNA is so stable. Um, and when you do assay the full genome, not only can you calculate any number of publicly available clocks, but it also becomes a shared resource for future studies in the cohort. The next measure of biological aging I want to talk about is cellular senescence. So senescence is really a cellular mechanism activated in response to stress and DNA damage, including from uh, oh, external stimuli like chemotherapy um, or smoking um, or physical inactivity. Um, and then it, it's kind of the downstream culmination of these different stimuli uh, it's a good thing in cancer cells. So senescence is actually a protective mechanism to prevent um, you know, tumor growth. Um, however, when you get accumulation of a senescent cells in the body that can promote chronic inflammation, declines in organ function, and is thought to be causally related to some of the aging related pathologies that we care about. Um, senescent cells express P16, and so P16 is a, a biomarker that can be readily measured in T cells from peripheral blood, and it's a robust measure of aging. Um, and it's been used a bit in studies of cancer survivorship. So this figure comes from one of those studies in which breast cancer patients were measured before receipt of anthracycline chemotherapy, and then at three time points afterwards. And what you see is that the P16 levels shoot up from pre to post treatment, and they remain elevated through the end of follow-up, which in this study was 12 months. Uh, and that's equivalent to about 15 years of, of uh, chronologic aging. So this uh, measure is indeed sensitive to receipt of cancer treatment. Um, I wanna highlight a difference here that, you know, unlike epigenetic age, which is from, you know, extracted DNA, which is quite stable, this measurement relies on RNA. So that's less stable. So often, Practically speaking, this could be more difficult in stored samples because you really want to have purified and frozen T cells within eight hours of collection in most protocols. So this might be a measure that is appealing, but more appropriate for prospective data collection for ongoing home visits in cohorts. The last measure I want to talk about is mitochondrial function. And while high DNA uh, or the mitochondrial DNA copy number is not a gold standard for mitochondrial function. I think it is actually a measure that's quite pragmatic for large epidemiologic cohorts. So that's what I'm going to focus on. Uh, high mtDNA copy number is considered a potential proxy for greater mitochondrial volume and function. So mitochondria are kind of this powerhouse of the cell. 
Um, and the mitochondrial theory of aging holds that it's really accumulated damage to the mitochondria and the mitochondrial DNA, they have their own genome, that reduces energy availability and increases reactive oxygen species production, leading to aging. So you can't, what you might want to do is sort of directly measure the uh, number of mitochondria, but that's not um, really possible. So what mitochondrial DNA copy number allows you to do is to um, use qPCR to create a ratio of the number of copies of some mitochondrial DNA uh, gene target to um, the number of copies of a nuclear reference gene. And then that tells you about, um, hopefully, the, the copy number of mitochondrial DNA. So that's something that you can readily measure. That ratio is something you can readily measure from extracted DNA from blood or other tissue is correlated with energy reserve and oxidative stress. And you can also use pre-existing microarray or sequencing data, which many cohorts have. So that's one of the reasons I think that this measure is, is so appealing. Um, when you do measure it, you uh, often find that lower mitochondrial DNA copy number increases uh, frailty and sarcopenia. Uh, that includes in studies of cancer survivors, lower mitochondrial DNA copy number has been associated with frailty and sarcopenia. It also tends to be lower in long-term survivors than in newly diagnosed patients. Um, but context really matters because also, you know, this is a citation from a recent meta-analysis that found that higher mtDNA copy number in blood predicted poor cancer prognosis in cancer patients, but higher mtDNA copy number in tumor tissue predicted just the opposite. Um, so I think I put these conflicting associations up here because it's less that they're conflicting and more that it's really highlights the importance of biological context when you want to interpret these data. So biological context is very important. Higher or lower mtDNA copy number can indicate mitochondrial dysfunction. So you could get higher mtDNA copy number maybe as a compensatory mechanism if there's damage to the mitochondrial genome, so DNA, um, mutation deletions. Uh, or you could get lower mitochondrial DNA copy number indicative of dysfunction with aging. Um, in addition, the number of mtDNA copies is going to depend on the tissue. So it's going to be higher in, say, muscle or heart tissue than it is in peripheral blood, but also the cell type. So if you're using peripheral blood, then you know, the immune cell composition and the number of platelets are really going to matter for, um, for, this, for this measurement. So these things need to be considered. Um, I think the conclusion is really that this can provide biological insights uh, and also is practical to measure in cohorts, but it's best if paired with uh, functional measures, perhaps in a subset, things like um, measures of mitochondrial DNA integrity, mutation deletions, or mitochondrial respiration, say, through oxidative phosphorylation. So um, that will help interpret what, what is really the meaning and the context for for mtDNA copy number findings in, in your cohort. So the second uh, bucket of aging measurements that I want to talk about is phenotypic aging. And I'm really going to focus here on just sarcopenia, age-related and pathology-related loss of skeletal muscle, since that's something we've done a lot of work on and also that is relevant to cohorts. So the dominant measure of body composition in on observational oncology research has really been from clinical CT scans. So if your cohort is linked to the electronic medical record, you could potentially pull down a large number of these scans because these are standard of care in many, many cancers for diagnosis and surveillance, and they're a gold standard method for assessing body composition. Um, so we've done this in large numbers of breast and colorectal cancer patients. What we've done is used the kind of canonical method of taking out the third lumbar vertebra from the CT series, this is a landmark very well correlated with whole body volumes of these tissues. And then we segment uh, historically manually, but now there's lots of automated programs that do this, um, the area of skeletal muscle at the L3 that's shown in red. And then you can apply cut points to uh, measure sarcopenia. And when you do that, you see that low skeletal muscle mass is related to anywhere from a 20 to 30% risk of death after cancer diagnosis, even in non-metastatic patients. Um, and if you have both sarcopenia and obesity, then the risk of death is more like 40%. So these, are, these contain important prognostic information, and they're 
really high quality existing clinical data in many cases. But this sort of most suited to a case only analysis because you're not going to have CT usually because of the ionizing radiation in your non cancer participants, in, at least not um, in large numbers. And so that's why many cohorts uh, have used DEXA. Uh, DEXA has been collected prospectively, for example, in the Women's Health Initiative, a subset of those women were followed over time and have repeated DEXA measurements. And that's true in many other cohorts too. Um, so for example, this figure comes from a study by my colleague Grant Williams, in which he looked in the health a ABC cohort, which is a, a cohort that is really about aging and body composition. And he took measures of appendicular lean mass. So that's sort of the pinkish red in the body scan that you see on the left. Um, and it's appendicular lean mass because DEXA really doesn't directly measure muscle, it's measuring lean mass. So if you were to take total body lean mass, that would include the organs. And so appendicular lean mass is considered a better proxy for muscularity. When he did that, he then looked at the rate of decline in appendicular lean mass over time from before to after cancer diagnosis, or in the case of his non-cancer cohort, before to after an index date on, upon which they were matched to the cases. And you can see that the black and the light blue lines are not different before diagnosis. But after diagnosis, the orange line really declines at a much faster rate. So what I like about this study is, first of all, it demonstrates, it provides some evidence that there might be an accelerated aging phenotype at, in which appendicular lean mass declines at a faster rate in cancer cases than age match control. And second, it highlights a really nice design that where you have cancer cases and non-cancer controls that come from the same underlying source population, um, and allowing you to compare cancer to usual aging and hopefully hone in on the effects of cancer and its treatment on um, aging outcomes. The last measure of sarcopenia I want to talk about is D3 creatine dilution. And I'm going to talk about this because while it is really for prospective data collection, it would be difficult to, I think, to do in uh, stored samples because of the protocol. Um, it's gaining popularity. And actually, it was piloted with great success in the Women's Health Initiative by my colleague, Haley Bannock. And I believe that there are some plans to do it at a larger scale in survivors and uh, cancer-free controls. Um, and actually, we're doing it uh, at Kaiser in colon cancer patients on active treatment. And the way it works is that our patients take a D3 creatine pill. So it's a 60 milligram dose of labeled uh, creatine, it's labeled with a non radioactive isotopal hydrogen. And then, um, so they ingest this pill. And then, three to six days later, we take a urine sample and we can measure. Uh, labeled creatinine enrichment in urine using mass spec. And the way that this works is it kind of relies on some aspects of creatine biology. So first of all, creatine kind of comes from the diet or synthesis in the liver and the kidney, and then it's transported into skeletal muscle. And there's an irreversible uh, conversion at a constant rate of creatine to creatinine. And so that's kind of what allows you to calculate total body creatine pool, which is directly proportional to total body skeletal muscle mass. So a few things are important there. First, total body skeletal muscle mass, not appendicular uh, lean mass like DEXA provides. So that's appealing. In addition, creatine resides mostly in the contractile component of the sarcomere. So unlike DEXA, which is measuring lean mass, the thought is maybe this is a little closer to a direct measure of functional muscle. And that is supported by some initial data from the Mr. Oz cohort of community dwelling older men, in which um, my colleagues Peggy Cawthon and Bill Evans saw that D3 creatine had really robust relationships with physical function, whereas DEXA lean mass did not. And one reason for that might be that as we age, there's more lipid and fibrosis and you know, non-functional uh, content of, of the lean mass um, that really isn't functional muscle. Um, and maybe creatine is better at getting into functional muscle is the thought. Okay, the third um, bucket of aging, the last bucket of aging I want to talk about is functional aging. And here I'm going to focus on frailty. So frailty is a geriatric syndrome of decreased physiologic reserve and multiple syndrome impairments 
that increase your vulnerability to stressors like cancer chemotherapy or surgery. Um, and there's different paradigms of frailty assessment that are really applicable in cohort studies. One which we've used in the Women's Health Initiative is the freed frailty phenotype. So there's a frailty score in the WHI and also in many other cohorts um, that covers the five domains that are really indicative of the, this clinical phenotype. And those are exhaustion, low physical activity, weakness, slow walking, and unintentional weight loss. And so we have a five point score, zero to five in the WHI that kind of describes this phenotype. Um, I also wanna talk about cumulative deficits because while I see these as more, the initial free frailty phenotype was kind of defined to be separate from comorbidity. And I see these cumulative deficit indices as more related to comorbidity scores because essentially they tally everything that's wrong with the participant all the different physical and cognitive deficits that have arisen from different uh, frailty related diseases and disabilities. So they tend to be correlated with comorbidity scores, but I think they can be quite useful and practical in a cohort context. And actually I've used them a lot. Uh, the hospital frailty risk score is one that is easily derived from medical record data. And to use that as an example, unlike a five point frailty score, it gives you a continuous granular um, quantitation of, of the patient's frailty along a spectrum that allows for better discrimination in predictive models. And so these cumulative deficit indices, while conceptually distinct from the frailty phenotype, can be quite practical for use in population health studies. And so I encourage you to look into those. Uh, another example is the Rockwood Frailty Index. And then lastly, this paradigm of comprehensive geriatric assessment, I think of as something that is usually utilized in oncology or surgical practice, but actually the WHI and many other cohorts have measured most of the domains that go into these, things like nutrition, uh, things like social support and mental health. And so there's potentially a way to get at that using cohort data as well. So to sum up this section, what are aging metrics? I mean, we already have them in cancer cohorts or we could collect them. So that includes leveraging things like stored blood to get at biological aging markers, using longitudinal assessment of phenotypes like body composition or physical function to get at other aspects of aging. And then the WHI, for example, has ongoing study visits and so do many cohorts. And so there's an opportunity there for novel collection or collection of some of these markers that are harder to measure from store sample. So for the third part of my talk, I just wanna share with you an example of how we've tried to operationalize some of these in the Women's Health Initiative. So the WHI is a participant in the NCI cohort consortium. It's composed of more than 160,000 women who enrolled beginning in 1993. So there's nearly 30 years of questionnaire, biospecimen, and in-person assessment on some of these women. And there's been more than 20,000 incident cancers in the WHI since its inception. And then laid on top of the WHI, is now the Life and Longevity After Cancer Cohort, LILAC, um, which is really a powerful resource. Uh, actually, Betty, who introduced me, is one of the, the PIs of that. And they've collected treatment and outcomes data for eight of the major cancers and tumor tissue for solid tumors, as well as questionnaire data that's more specific to the cancer survivorship experience. And so this combination is really powerful. Laying a survivorship cohort on top of an incidence cohort uh, uh, provides a really rich data source um, that we've tried to use. So one of the ways we've tried to use it is using that frailty score that I told you about. And what we found is that um, frailty before or at cancer diagnosis increases the risk of death after cancer diagnosis. And this is especially true for those who have a more favorable prognosis. So for example, what you're looking at here is a force plot from our recent study where we're looking at at diagnosis or pre-diagnosis frailty. And what we see is that the risk of death is higher for breast, colorectal, and endometrial cancers than for these more rapidly fatal cancer sites like ovarian and lung. And what I think is interesting about this is it sort of points to, you know, who's the population of interest here? In some ways, it is 
the people who have uh, the best prognosis because they're going to live for a long time and experience the burden of long-term and late effects of cancer treatment potentially and some of these aging outcomes. Um, not to say that aging is unimportant in uh, rapidly fatal cancers, but it, it's, um, they're not gonna perhaps experience the same longevity and therefore the same um, aging opportunity for aging outcomes. So the next thing we did to dig into this was we looked at the rate of increase in frailty score over time. And this was a case only analysis. So this was just a limited number of cancer uh, survivors in WHI that met the criteria for our other time updated analysis. Um, and again, we saw that diagnosis is an inflection point. The rate of increase in the frailty score picked up speed after cancer diagnosis. And that was especially true actually in lung cancer, although it was true for all cancers. So then the next thing we did is we tried to dig into what component of the frailty score was really changing. And what we found is that this was really driven by changes in physical function scores. And I'm gonna talk about those for a moment because they're uh, something that's measured in a lot of cohorts. So we've now begun to look at trajectories of physical function measured by the RAND 36 item short form health survey. So the SF36 physical function scale is a validated measure of physical function, is quite sensitive to change over time, um, perhaps more so than something like activities of daily living, which show change, but sometimes at a more progressed state of impairment. Um, in WHI, this questionnaire was collected annually since 2005, so there's a lot of data, which I'll show you. And it's 10 self-report items that represent a hierarchical range of difficulties, including things like lifting groceries, walking, dressing, et cetera. So um, many of the cohorts may have measured the SF36. In WHI, we have this information on more than 13,000 lilac cases that we matched to up to five cancer-free controls, meaning women without a cancer history. And we matched them based on age at WHI enrollment and year of WHI enrollment. I'm gonna pause here for a second because this is a method that you too could use in your cohort. Basically, the idea was by matching at age and enrollment and year of enrollment, at least they have the same opportunity for follow-up. Um, we also matched on study arm. Um, and, and effectively, that means that they're matched at the index date, which is age at diagnosis or um, the index date for the case. So what you're seeing here on the y-axis is the number of participants. The controls are shown in orange, the cases are shown in blue. And um, also I'm showing the number of um, participants with SF36 data at each of these points. So about half of the women have their closest measurement within one year, actually within 10 months of their diagnosis. So we have nice data density uh, with close to the diagnosis time point. And 70% of these women have at least two pre-diagnosis and at least two post-diagnosis measurements. So this is suggesting that this is really fertile ground for um, studying uh, aging phenotypes over time, trajectories of aging, in this case, physical function. And so that's what we've tried to do. We use linear mixed effects models with uh, variables for case status. So were you a cancer case or did you never have a history of cancer or control? Pre versus post-diagnosis period, so a binary indicator for that, as well as years since diagnosis, so that continuous time scale uh, aligned with time since diagnosis, and the interactions of each of these. We adjusted for our trial arm, age at diagnosis, socioeconomic status, and some other lifestyle uh, confounders. And what we found is that the trajectory of decline in physical function differs by receipt of cancer or chemotherapy. So here you have, if you move your eyes to the left-hand side of this figure, you have physical function, SF36 scores on the y-axis, and they're declining over time at a similar rate for cases and controls prior to cancer diagnosis. Then at cancer diagnosis, um, there's actually in this model, it's an intercept change, but there's this acute drop um, for the cancer cases following diagnosis. So you see a small drop for the blue cases. Those are individuals who never received chemotherapy and a pretty profound drop for the chemotherapy treated cases in gray. Um, the blue cases continue to decline at a similar rate to their 
uh, age match peers. Uh, whereas the gray cases, they have this drop, but then there's a little bit of a rebound. The, the slope is declining, but it's not as steep. And so 10 years out, those women who are still alive or participating have very similar physical function scores to the cancer-free controls, but it takes a decade to catch up. This also differs by cancer site. So here I'm showing you breast cancer, which is by far the most populous cancer in the WHI, and um, it's pretty similar to the overall results I showed you before. But let's take a look at lung cancer. So, you know, in the breast cancer cases, really not much difference between cases and controls prior to diagnosis than this acute drop and a continued decline. In lung, the, there's actually worse physical function prior to cancer diagnosis, a really kind of catastrophic drop in physical function following diagnosis and treatment, presumably. And then they never catch up, um, unfortunately. Even a decade out, those cancer cases still contributing data are um, not at the level of physical function of their age match peers. So I think this says we have a lot more work to do. We need to explore the effects of specific treatment regimens within cancer site and cancer stage. Uh, I would like to model this short-term drop better and kind of see if we can get at uh, inflection points or at resilience within that, that kind of acute period, the shorter term uh, period around cancer diagnosis. Um, and then there's a lot of considerations for this data that I'm going to highlight because I think they're relevant to your own analyses in, in other cohorts too. So first of all, these analyses are conditional on survival. So in a sense, that's a good thing, right? I mean, I highlighted this is kind of the population of interest, people who are living long enough to experience uh, age-related outcomes. Uh, on the other hand, it's not the whole story. Uh, so one of the things we're going to do next is examine whether the rate of physical function decline in the post-diagnosis period is predictive of death. Um, maybe it's those people who experience the most profound drops who die the quickest, and that, that's really important to know. Um, we're also going to explore uh, potentially IP weighting to, to try to get at um, this survival effect on, on our data. Um, we're also going to look at latent classes to try to define different trajectory groups, and that will allow us to look at prediction of membership in those groups, you know, who is it who is really at risk of catastrophic decline after diagnosis versus what's the group of people who are really robust um, to the effects of cancer and its treatments on aging outcomes. Next, I think an important consideration is data density and this concept of resilience of bounce back after cancer treatment. The precipitous drop I showed you, that intercept shift, it's probably reflecting an acute effect of cancer treatment that the WHI wasn't really designed to capture. It's not as if cancer survivors were administered physical function surveys on a monthly basis from before to after cancer treatment. These, these questionnaires were given annually. So we could try to um, tune in a little more to that short-term period and plan to do so. But you know there may be cohorts in this consortium that really have administered surveys to survivors at, at a greater frequency and can really model that, that um, drop and then rebound that resilience. Um, what we can do in WHI is to get at the effects of specific cancer treatment because thanks to the LILAC study, we have really nice data on uh, not only chemotherapy, but other cancer treatment regimens. In addition, we'd like to do some future research on some of these biological aging measures. Essentially what we've done here, but instead of functional aging outcomes like physical performance, looking at biological aging from stored blood samples or existing measurements. And there's also upcoming data collection in the WHI, you know, prospective data collection at new home visits where new samples could be collected or new functional measures could be collected. So to sum up this section, um, I think what WHI illustrates that's a potentially a unique strength, but also might be something that's shared by some of the other cohorts is we have a really large sample of cancer survivors and non-cancer women, women who don't have a cancer history from the same source population. They, uh, both groups have long-term pre and post index date biospecimens, questionnaires, and in-person assessments. Um, and that is a really incredibly unique data set that can get at some of these unanswered questions um, and contribute to characterizing long-term trajectories of aging and biological and functional aging uh, associations. Um, 
But that unique data comes with some methodologic challenges that I've alluded to. Um, so I think with that, uh, in whatever time we have remaining, I'd love to hear your comments and, and try to address any of your questions. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Felicino. I think uh, the presentation has been very interesting and engaging. We've had a few questions. Uh, the first one is from Dr. Mel Melody Chiafino. She wants to know whether P16 is routinely tested in clinics in any clinical scenario. I don't believe so. I will, you know, full disclosure, I'm an epidemiologist, so I'm kind of a user of these metrics rather than a producer or kind of biomarker expert in my own right. But my understanding with P16 is that it, it has clinical potential in the sense that it is actually predictive of things like chemotherapy toxicity, but um, it's not used routinely in the clinic to my knowledge. Um, there are There is um, a nice and growing body of data on the relevance of P16 to measuring uh, chemotherapy-induced aging. Uh, and so it's an appealing metric for that reason, but it's not something that I think you would find you know, in the in the medical record of a patient. Thank you. The next question is from Dr. Anna Presmet. She wants to know how the epigenetic aging clock, how is that different from other epigenetic biomarkers that can predict outcomes in cancer survivors? So I'm maybe what, again, I'm not, uh, you know, fully focused on epigenetic aging myself and some of my colleagues on this call are, but the way I think about the clocks is kind of as a summary measure um, of, of methylation age. And, you know, like many of the other measures I highlighted, it's in some sense tissue dependent. So you could measure these clocks in adipose tissue. You could measure them in peripheral blood. That's kind of what I focused on because I think it's a lot of times where, you know, a lot of these cohorts have stored Buffy coat. But maybe the, the um, participant is kind of getting at the fact that there are epigenetic changes induced in various tissues in response to stimuli like chemotherapy or caloric restriction or physical activity that may mediate some of the aging outcomes. And, and that those kind of epigenetic changes studied as a mediator uh, or a direct link, a causal link to aging outcomes, that's kind of conceptually distinct from the aging clock. The aging clocks, in my view, are a biomarker. They can allude to different aging pathways because they're trained on, say, phenotypic age. They're trained on things like immunosenescence in some cases. But they're not themselves um, necessarily a direct mediator because they're really uh, they're a DNA methylation predictor of some aging outcome. Now, they're still very useful as a biomarker because they can highlight the different aging-related biological pathways and generate hypotheses about those. And also because they, they have really robust associations with these outcomes. So they're representing um, something that is highly predictive of, of aging outcomes. But I think of them as conceptually distinct from, you know, say a controlled experiment where you're looking at what, what are the epigenetic changes induced by some, um, some intervention. I hope that helps. Great, thank you. The next question is from Dr. Elena Martinez. She wants to know if you are aware of any variability uh, and function differences in the aging markets across the various racial ethnic groups. Oh, that is a really great question. And I uh, actually don't know the answer, unfortunately, but I think that's probably important to at least examine. Um, but you know, because many of these cohorts, including WHI, have a racially and ethnically diverse sample. But I think one of the challenges always is going to be um, self-identified race ethnicity is kind of a, a social construct, which is, it, it uh, comes often with differential exposure to um, stressors like, you know, lifestyle behaviors, but also environmental exposure um, and other things. So disentangling, if these biomarkers are differ by race and ethnicity, untangling the biology from the social and environmental aspects is going to be a pretty challenging. Right. The next question is from Dr. Sulkin. She wants, um, he wants to know 
can decrease in the number of stem cells be quantified across multiple tissues? I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> okay. We have a question from Dr. Streck, Brennan Streck. Chronic psychological stress is also suspected as a driver of aging, that is inflammation-related aging, via psychoneural or psychoendocrine pathways. Given that many survivors experience chronic stress related to cancer, do you think psychological stress could be a driver in accelerating aging? Yes, I do. Um, I, I think that's going to be something that will be very interesting to study. And actually, that the cohorts are, um, you know, if anybody can tackle this challenge, the cohorts have some of these data. Because, um, for example, the LILAC study does ask about um, psychosocial distress, uh, as well as, you know, financial toxicity and other things. Um, and I, I just, I'm, I'm really grateful for that question because I focused kind of exclusively in this talk on what are what's sort of the, the cellular stress induced by chemotherapy but obviously the experience of cancer diagnosis and treatment is very psychologically distressing for many reasons and, and that um, that exposure to psychosocial stress can be really uh, difficult to disentangle from um, the the uh, external, if you will, stressors like chemotherapy, um, but very important to do so. And the first step to doing that is measuring both of those things and, and the cohorts have done that. So uh, very important question. Dr. Len Wilkins wants to know whether radiation therapy have the same effect on aging as chemotherapy. So that's a great question that I don't think we know the answer to. I mean, one of the gaps highlighted in the NOSI is you know, what are the specific effects of particular cancer treatments on these outcomes. I can tell you that, for example, in um, studies of adult survivors of childhood cancer, radiation does seem to have profound effects on many of the aging biomarkers that I highlighted. Um, so does chemotherapy, which is often administered with radiation. But I don't think we know the answer to that just because we either don't have the data yet, or uh, meaning we haven't measured the biomarkers we would need to to study the differences in treatment regimen, or the data haven't been collected at all, um, you know, in, in any cohort. Um, so for example, in the breast cancer paper I showed where the epigenetic aging markers increased after chemoradiotherapy, they really didn't have the statistical power to tease out um, individual treatment regimens. And of course, that those comparisons are complicated by issues of you know, uh, confounding by indication, essentially, that, that patients who receive different therapies may not be always perfectly comparable. Um, but, but that's going to be an important gap to address moving forward. Dr. Betty Kane wants to know that conceiving all the markets that you described in your presentation, what is the lo lowest hanging fruit in cancer cohorts? and could be addressed across multiple cohorts if people are interested in collaborating to investigate? Yeah, uh, that is a really good question. I mean, I tried to focus here on measurements that I think are commonly used in cohorts or could be measured. So epigenetic age is a, a nice biomarker because it, I think it's reached a level of maturity where some of the challenges methodologically are understood. There's efforts to try to make these clocks more reliable that exist, um, and they can be measured in stored specimens, uh, sometimes without maybe same, the same caveats as something like mtDNA copy number, where maybe, you know, if um, a complete blood count was conducted, you can control for the um, cell type composition, but sometimes that wasn't collected. No, you know, there's issues for epigenetic age in terms of um, how the DNA was extracted that might affect comparability, but I think there could be potential for um, collaboration there. In addition, something like the SF36 physical function measurement. I mean, it's a, it's a, a pretty simple questionnaire-based measurement, but it's a validated scale that, that's commonly measured in cohort studies. And uh, maybe there could be some cross cohort or at least between cohort comparisons conducted to um, particularly for 
less common cancer sites where you want to study the effect of different treatment regimens or characterize the trajectory of aging in a less common cancer, maybe um, the cohort studies could pull resources to, to get, it, get at that. Dr. Corinne Leach says cancer treatment data is incredibly complex to work with and quote from medical records. Any suggestions on how to group treatment details or depth of treatment data needed for this time of work? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, so one of the things that I've been interested in is there are toxicity indexes that try to get at across chemotherapy regimens, for example, how toxic was the regimen? allowing you then to compare between regimens using a single continuous scale. Um, and if you follow up with me, I can share with you the citations if you're not familiar, but um, it's one of those uh, toxicity indices, which is published as part of the CRASH score for um, predicting risk of chemotherapy toxicity in older adults. And um, I think that that's something that has some potential to allow us to compare across, you know, really heterogeneous regimen types. Also, I think one of the ways we've tried to tackle this is, um, you know, breast cancer is low hanging fruit because it's a very common cancer. There's a lot of women. And so you have uh, the potential maybe to stratify by more homogenous treatment regimens within that cancer. Um, and so that, that's another way to get at it, is to narrow the scope um, so that you're looking at uh, a manageable number of treatment types and agents, the toxicity profiles of which have been well characterized. Great. So Dr. Brick asks, have the WHI and the LILAC cohorts data been linked to, medical, to Medicare claims data? to provide greater detail about treatment and utilization of services? If so, yes. what topics have been previously explored? Mm, yes, yeah. so the WHI um, has a searchable, so the whi.org actually has a, a search box where you can see all of the manuscript proposals, everything that's been proposed and published. So it's a really great um, publicly available resource in that sense. Uh, my understanding is that a LILAC actually has linked we're available to Medicare data and pulled in that information on um, the participants. And so that data is available. I don't know um, to what extent it's been used. I'm only starting to use it myself. Great, so our last question comes from Dr. Son. And uh, he wants to know, can any of the aging measures be reversed or slowed? In terms of preventive efforts, what can an individual do to slow this process? That is, I think, the best question of all, what can we do about this? Um, and I think, you know, there's actually, that's one of the things highlighted in the NOCI is a real area of need. Developing and testing interventions to uh, mitigate or even reverse. So the thing that people often talk about are actual senolytics, but um, maybe I'm very interested myself in non-pharmacologic interventions and lifestyle. And there is suggestive evidence that lifestyle, physical activity uh, and diet in particular can slow aging uh, as measured by these biomarkers, at least some of them. For example, um, certain epigenetic clocks seem to be responsive to lifestyle intervention, uh, for example. There's known effects of lifestyle intervention on mitochondrial function. Um, and so I think that holds up the potential for, you know, at least my primary interest lifestyle um, for mitigating some of this damage um, that, you know, chemotherapy uh, as stated articulately in the papers that I highlighted at the beginning, chemotherapy saves lives, but it also uh, causes damage to normal cells that, that has the, that manifests in toxicity and long-term and late effects that can shorten uh, life and, and reduce quality of life. And so mitigating that damage is, is of great interest. Great. Well, thank you very much. That's all the questions we have. We thank you for this really interesting presentation. I will now hand over to our host to give us the closing remarks. Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for a great presentation and, and Sam for moderating uh, Q&A. Um, if you have any suggestions or other topics uh, you'd like to hear from, please email ncicohortconsortium at mail.nih.gov. Um, a recording of this webinar will be posted with one to two weeks on the consortium website, so please continue to check back. And with that, thank you everyone again for your time and joining us today. <laughs>